coming back to commemorate to all of the people who lost their lives over here. an unbelievable light that is igniting the world. That's what you all are. Spread the light of what it means to be a survivor to the next generation. We're not just survivors. We didn't just survive, we thrive. That's, that's my message. In these challenging times, never ever give up. There's always hope. We have to support each other. We should unite as a people. You have to find ways to make sure that the light is now brilliant. Light the fire, pass it on, make it bigger, make it stronger. Let it grow into a bright light that will never be extinguished. Shalom, and welcome to the Passing on the Talk Ceremony for International Holocaust Memorial Day. Shalom, and welcome to the Talk Ceremony for International Holocaust Memorial Day. We, the children of the 21st century, would like to welcome you, the survivors, and thank you for being here and sharing your stories. We are growing up in a world where the events of the Shah can seem far away but we are privileged to have you to tell us what happened in your own words. Our children and grandchildren will one day ask us with wonder if we ever met the miraculous people who survived the destruction. Despite all the suffering you went through, you went on to build families, communities, and the state of Israel. We are ready to learn the lessons that you received from your parents and they from theirs. We are inspired by your faith in yourselves and in humanity inspired by your belief that the world can be a better place. We are proud to be the ones to pass on your torch, which will illuminate the world. Hi, my name is Svi Sperba Shalom. And on behalf of more than 150 survivors, and over 80 organizations, partner organizations that we have here, we welcome you to the ceremony for the Holocaust Memorial Day. 15 years ago, together with Rabbi Naftali Schiff, I founded Jeruts. We were motivated by the need for people in our generation to learn from you, the survivors. It was not enough to say the words never again after hearing stories of the untellable, but it was for us to learn what we can do from your testimonies, to understand, how you overcame the most severe form of persecution and still went on to become productive members of the communities in which you settled. You have exhibited an extraordinary resilience and love of family and community. Your survival is an example of human spirit's ability to adapt, to rebuild, to recover from the lowest point of humanity. You provide hope and set an example to us all. It is by no coincidence that the portion of the Torah that we read this week is B'Shalach. We are leaving Egypt and heading to Israel. We are stopped at the Reed Sea. The people of Israel are shell-shocked. But then the Talmud describes Nachshon ben Aminadav. Witnessing this paralysis of the Jewish people, he jumps into the raging waters and leads the way to freedom and ultimately to a new life and a new chapter for the Jewish people. The Nachshon ben Aminadavs of our generation are you, the survivors, who when all, all odds were stacked against you, you helped split the seas and have led us to build new lives 
and to continue to write a new Jewish book. You've taught us to look at every situation and never give up. As Viktor Frankl wrote in Man's Search for Meaning, forces beyond your control can take away everything you possess, except one thing, your freedom to choose how you will respond to the situation. Despite tremendous hardships during the Holocaust, you the survivors held on to hope. Hope that you would rebuild your lives. You've taught us that nothing can stop us if we work together. Today is a tribute to you as it should be. With over 150 survivors who've joined this event, survivors that span the globe. We have survivors who have joined us from Israel, from the USA, the UK, Canada, South Africa, Poland, Australia, Germany, Switzerland, Belgium, Hungary, and at the same time, let me send our condolences to the Bozena family, as we heard yesterday, as one of our survivors had passed away. It is with amazement that we have stood and watched you all, you who arose from the ashes and have never ceased to contribute to society. Even today, you turned up to show your resilience and your will to continue to build the world that we live in. The urge of defiance that nothing will beat you you found a sense of purpose by bearing witness to the trustees that you endured. You speak passionately about your hope for a world that is free from racial intolerance, bigotry and hatred. You stand up and you fight for human rights, global injustice and social changes that improve the quality of our lives. We've had the incredible privilege to connect with so many of you our dear, precious, esteemed survivors of the course of this ever so challenging year. Whilst many of us have perhaps moaned through these times, I can personally attest to the fact that never, not once, did I hear one single word of complaint from any of you, from even one survivor over the past 10 months. A frustration perhaps, not being able to meet young people, to share your memories, to teach, to inspire, and to love life to the full. But never, not once, not one word of complaint. And today we humbly pay homage, homage to you. And we thank you for having shared so much with us. Last year, we stood with many of you, the survivors, at the 75th commemoration of the liberation of Auschwitz. And at the end of Shabbat, each one of you held up so high a Havdalah torch, a candle. We made a pledge to you. We shall never forget you. We shall never forget your families. We shall never forget the six million. We pledge to you to carry your torch aloft, to remember that which each of you has shared with us and that which each of you has taught us. And today, this afternoon, this morning, this evening, wherever in the world you are, we are, we're all one. And we reiterate our pledge to you now. Each of you has not just held up a torch in the darkness. Rather, you have and you continue to be the light, our light in the darkness. Your resilience, your persistence, your insistence, your hope, your tolerance, your love, your drive, your energy, your passion will remain with us, all of us, forever. It's an honor to welcome Mr. Manfred Goldberg from London, born in 1930 in Kassel, central Germany. Mr. Goldberg witnessed his synagogue being torched on Kristallnacht. He subsequ subsequently endured three years in the Riga ghetto in Latvia. And after having been transferred to a grueling slave camp in Stutthof, the concentration camp, and a number of others, he was ordered on an appalling death march and was finally liberated in Neustadt, Germany. 
Thank you, Mr. Goldberg, for sharing your memories and passing on the torch together with us today. My name is Manfred Goldberg Michael, but uh, Manfred in German. Shortly after Kristallnacht, our Jewish school was forcibly closed and all Jewish children who attended non-Jewish schools were expelled. So there was no further education for any Jewish child. A teacher from the Jewish school who was deported with us to the ghetto and he approached me and said, I know you don't have your father with you, so if you'll permit me, um, your bar mitzvah is coming up, would you like me to help you? And I must confess to you that I really did not have much idea of what bar mitzvah meant, what it was all about. I, that I didn't attend any services in the camps throughout. The only religious service ever was the day of my bar mitzvah. And this was co completely organized by that teacher, Herr Bacher. It, it was a miracle that this teacher managed to get together nine people. And I had the privilege of being counted number 10 for the first time in my life. I mean, in retrospect, I realize the significance. At the time, I, I didn't really properly appreciate what, what was happening. I, I cannot tell you in, in what esteem, what admiration I hold with this teacher. He was such a dedicated person who uh, was prepared to uh, more or less devote his life to, to people like me because that there was a consequence to what he did. I can tell you in all honestly and from my heart that you will never fully be able to understand or anticipate the lifelong impact your behavior towards children will have in later life. To you, it may just be a, a transient occasion, but to children, many of these occasions are lasting memories. And it can have vast consequences in later life. Please remember that when you're tempted to be short-tempered or resentful towards a child that may not respond in the way you would like it to. Please be patient and remember that there are consequences to one's actions and above all to one's words. Once words are spoken, they can never be unspoken. I remember that clearly and it's a lesson I, I have been learning quite early in life after liberation and I have been or I've tried to be as careful, extra careful before speaking. I'm known as the silent type because I really appreciate that often silence is golden where speech <laughs> is not. Thank you, Mr. Goldberg. It's an honor now to introduce Professor Deborah Lipstadt. Deborah Lipstadt is the Dorot Professor of Modern Jewish History and Holocaust Studies at Emory University. She holds over six honorary do uh, doctorates and is the author of numerous books. In an earlier interview, Professor Lipstadt commented that you only want to publish books that are relevant. And unfortunately, due to the rise in anti-Semitism over the world in the last few years, she felt that she must bring out her latest book, Antisemitism Here and Now, which is another National Book Award winner. The world got to know Deborah Lipstadt after the film Denial, where she fought Holocaust denier David Irving in court, and she won. However, we have known for, about her for a long time. She is one of the most sought after speakers today on the Holocaust and antisemitism today, and we are honored that she has given up time to address our passing of the torch ceremony. Professor Lipstadt. Welcome. 
it is a distinct privilege to say a few words to you this evening. Um, I know that last year you had a incredible experience of passing on the torch at the site of Auschwitz proper. Uh, today, because of COVID, uh, we can only gather virtually. Uh, but I'd like to share with you an anecdote um, that uh, something that happened to me shortly before COVID. Uh, I was in England at a famous uh, a book fair, a book festival, uh, Hay on Wai in Wales. It's one of the biggest book festivals in the world. And my book, Anti-Semitism Here and Now, had just appeared. Uh, and I was being interviewed by the uh, former editor of a major British daily. We had spent the afternoon together speaking about all sorts of things. And of course, she had read my book carefully. She knew about the trial, David Irving's uh, suit against me, the libel trial, et cetera, my work on Holocaust denial. And uh, she had told me most of the questions that she was going to ask me. Um, but then she sprung at the very end, she sprung one on me that I hadn't expected. And I don't know whether she had planned it or not, or it just came to her spontaneously. She said to me, Deborah, we have spent quite a bit of time together today before this uh, event, before this uh, program. And I can tell you're a very optimistic person. You're a very happy person. You, you, you enjoy life. Um, I don't get it. Uh, you spend most of your time studying how Jews were murdered, uh, you spent six years of your life fighting a lawsuit to clear your name. Uh, you could have settled. He was willing to settle with you for an apology and 500 pounds. And of course, you were never going to apologize to him for calling him a Holocaust denier. Then after your work on Holocaust denial, you spent all these years preparing this book on anti-Semitism. And now I know you're going all over the world talking about anti-Semitism and how much it concerns you. Please explain to me how it's possible that you can be an optimistic person. And I smiled and I thought about it. And then I told her the following, this uh, had been over the previous weekend, this was Sunday evening in the city of Bath in England. And uh, it's an ancient city, you know, the Romans discovered the baths there uh, in the first century. Um, and I had visited, in addition to visiting Stonehenge, which is nearby, as it visited the baths, the excavations. And you walk through them and it's like an ancient, first class spa. There's a steam room and a hot massage and hot pools and cool pools and a gym. Beautiful. I, and I thought if I had been around here at that time, I would have gladly joined up with the Romans and, and participated in the spa. This is some place I'd like to work out. And then I came to the temple because the Romans thought this was a temp, the, the, this, the hot springs were a gift from God. And so there was a temple to celebrate that. And I suddenly realized that I wouldn't have been so comfortable there. Certainly there were Jews who went to these spas and baths because they thought the whole idea of all these gods was Narish kite was silly. But still, I thought about all those centuries when Jews lived in better, worse, not so good conditions. And they always had the option of leaving their Jewish identity and joining the majority to live a materially better life, uh, to improve their status. And they didn't do it. They clung to what they believed. They reveled in what they believed. They developed unbelievable uh, intellectual, legal, uh, material artifacts, all sorts of, they created a culture, often living in difficulty circumstances and sometimes not so difficult, but often knowing that persecution could happen. And they had done this for millennia. So I said to my interlocutor, I said to the woman who was asking me the questions, I said, over all these centuries, Jews have clung to what they, and reveled in, not just clung, it's, it, it sounded too uh, like you were saving a life, but they've reveled in who they are. How could I be pessimistic? How, we're, we're here, I said, as a historian, um, I can offer you no logical reason why there should be Jews in the world today. It just does not make sense. We shouldn't be here. I said, given that we're here, should I be one to end the, the links in the chain? Never. And I have to be optimistic. 
And then I told her of uh, the ghetto partisan song, Mir uh, Da, we are here on Achnupo, as it's sung in Hebrew. Um, I said, I'm here and carrying on a tradition. Um, I wish you this hundred and Svansi got may of Esrim until 120 years. And I wish you that you, you shall see children and grandchildren continuing the tradition. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Lipstadt. David Marx was born in the village of Sivania, Romania in 1928. He was number nine of 12 children. Age 16, he was transported to Auschwitz where 35 members of his family were sent straight to the gas chambers. David eventually got to Palestine where he served in the IDF as soon as it was formed. In age 92, David, David is still active in his woodwork shop, creating gifts for those he loves. As Elie Wiesel famously said, the opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. David Marx, your capacity to love humanity, to give of yourself is only matched by your energy, your drive and love of life itself. My name is David Marx. I am 92 years old, a Holocaust survivor, and I would like, I have the chance and to tell a little bit what I learned after the Holocaust of survivor. I was in Birkenau and, and Auschwitz and the most what we need was food and freedom. Those two items are the most important thing for a person. And if you don't have it, it you, you are nechshav like, like a mat, you are, you are not even alive. So I have a message to people which for years, how important freedom is. And I've, unfortunately, the last two weeks, three weeks, what we saw up in Washington, I want everybody should realize and they should keep an open mind that it's very fragile. I was raised in a family with 12 children. And what I got from my father and my mother, I till today, every day, I nourish from it. I, I believe in it. And I would love that other people should have, they should think about it and they should have some experience from my little speech. My mother was a very, very religious woman and she was the most important thing was that the 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 the, 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 the neighbors we should not because we were a little bit up, upper middle class they should not miss anything if there was any food left over or something and you should always see how to help your neighbor get involved in the community see what you can help see what you can do for the, your, your neighbor it's it goes two ways you're gonna get the biggest share not him that is that lives to me till today my father he was a special man when the Nazis came in and everything stopped, Jewish children couldn't get any education, nothing, nothing. So the only chance was to stay home and to commiserate. My father said, no, my message to the next generation, be honest, keep busy and live a full life, never give up, and look for the future. I'm fortunate enough because I always believed in the future and I always said never give up and I thank God I met the love of my life 
at the age 92. And I married her, New Year's, and the best is yet to come. And we're going to have a wonderful future. And I believe I'm Yisrael Chai. Thank you, David. Thank you. So Simon Sharma is an English historian. His speciality is in history of art, Dutch, French, and Jewish history. He's well known for his dynamic and compelling televised BBC documentary series, be they about the history of Britain or the story of the Jews. So Simon is a true Renaissance man and an extremely busy one at that. But he believes passionately about the preservation of memory, the conservation of Holocaust history, and in particular, passing on the torch of survivor testimony and legacy. We so appreciate, Sir Simon, you taking time out of your schedule in order to share a few minutes with us today. We welcome you today, Holocaust Memorial Day, to address our survivors, their families, and our audience worldwide. Thank you. us from Egypt to our children and future generations. And with a non-Jewish history hat on, also works always aware that memory, mnemosyne, was the mother of Cleo, the muse of history. And so much of history depends on reliable memory, especially I think in these days when short attention span on the internet threatens oblivion to some of the most important issues that there are in history, the issues in history that affect the way we think of ourselves as ethical and moral and sentient human beings. The internet, which we once thought of essentially in our innocence as being able to provide a whole stream, a conduit for the transmission of truth, has, through no fault of its founders, turned into an ideal nesting place for the propagation of wicked fictions or of fictions and fables, the creation of echo chambers of fanaticism based on nothing else. If once we thought that Holocaust education would put to rest the most insidious uh, mythologies of anti-Semitism were cured and disabused of that illusion tragically, we have so much work still to do. Uh, it was just horrifying just the other day um, here in the United States, looking at video coverage of the invasion of the United States Capitol by a sundry gathering of, uh, of uh, not demonstrators, of rioters, to see somebody actually wearing a T-shirt which said, I suppose he thought it was a joke, Camp Auschwitz, Camp Auschwitz, everyone, or 6MWE, which apparently stands for six million were not enough. Equally horrifying to see the yellow star pinned on the coats of people protesting against vaccination or having to wear a mask to deal with the ravages of the pandemic. This terrible degradation and adulteration of things which are burned into our shared memory, whether were Jews or not Jews, the sort of convenience exploitation of the Holocaust of the Shoah only reinforces our sense of the preciousness of witness. Um, and I would like to thank all those involved in this essential work from the bottom of my heart. I wish the Jews of the world survivors well. Um, I wish everybody um, who listens and pays attention and heeds this shocking story, even as the tide of anti-Semitism, alas, is rising, not falling, to insist that this work goes on, flourishes, and as we like to say, Tikkun heals the world of its nightmares and horrors. Thank you. As we gather today to reach back into the past 
and to find the sparks that we wish to pass on to the future, we know that sometimes the sounds and the tunes we're familiar with transport us back to another era. Violin makers Amnon and Avshi Weinstein, the founders of Violins of Hope, have dedicated their lives to finding and restoring instruments which survived the Holocaust and allowing their music to be heard once again. In 1924, the Jewish industrialist and amateur violinist Shimon Krongold came to Yaakov Zimmerman, Warsaw's finest Jewish violin maker, and requested a new violin with a Magen David with the Star of David inlaid into the back. Come 1939, Shimon fled from Warsaw to Russia and ended up in Tashkent, where he died of typhus shortly before the end of the war. Following the war, a survivor from Tashkent arrived in Jerusalem together with the violin, which had hidden inside it a note written in Yiddish. It read, I made this violin for my loyal friend Shimon Krongold, signed Yaakov Zimmerman, Warsaw, 1924. The violin was returned to a branch of the Krongold family, and today it has been restored, and the music which spans the generations can once again be heard. Today, we are delighted to welcome the acclaimed violinist Chagai Shaham to play that violin. He'll perform the Hebrew melody by Joseph Achron in the workshop of Violins of Hope, surrounded by instruments, each carrying their own story of tragedy and survival. We would like to thank Violins of Hope Los Angeles for this special opportunity. As we incline our ears to hear the voices of the survivors and the music of the past, we remember those who were silenced. During the piece of music, our friend and colleague Wojtek Smolin, who is at the site of Auschwitz-Birkenau, will light a candle on our behalf. And we invite you, the survivors, together with thousands of you joining us online to light a memorial candle. As we join together from across the world, we commit ourselves to remember the past, but ultimately to bring more light into the world and to pass on the torch.
Rabbi Sachs of blessed memory would often mention that survivors were the most inspirational cadre of people he'd ever met. The following was recorded by Rabbi Sachs just last year for International Holocaust Memorial Day. There's a verse in the book of Daniel that says, that those who bring decency, goodness, righteousness to the many are like stars that shine forever. This year's Holocaust Memorial Day theme is to be a light in the darkness. In private conversations that I had with Rabbi Sachs, he literally referred to you, to the survivors, as his guiding lights during periods of personal darkness. With his untimely passing this year, we all feel a void, a darkness. But you, our survivors, are our shining lights, our navigation stars in an oft dark place. And much as the words and the messages of Rabbi Sachs we know will live on forever. So too, our dear survivors, we assure you today, your stories, your memories shall continue to be passed on by us all. Time and again, the Bible uses the word Zachor, remember. And that's what we do today on International Holocaust Memorial Day. We remember the victims of the Holocaust, as well as other victims of other tragedies human beings have inflicted on one another. Why is it important to remember? Because memory of the evils of the past is the best way of avoiding evils in the future. We can't bring the dead back to life, but we can ensure that they didn't die in vain. Those who forget may repeat. Those who remember know that we have to find another way. One of the greatest privileges of my life has been coming to know Holocaust survivors. Most of them lost their families. And so they became a family to one another. They helped one another live through the trauma, the loss of all they knew and loved. They'd walked, each one of them, through the valley of the shadow of death. Yet never have I met people with such a tenacious hold on life. What I found most moving was the way in recent years they've shared their memories with others, especially with young people, the builders of our future. I can hardly begin to understand the courage it takes to relive the pain of those nightmare years. Yet they've done so, not in hate or bitterness or anger, but the opposite. What they've wanted to say is, don't take freedom for granted, cherish it. Don't take prejudice for granted, challenge it. Don't stand by in the face of violence and hate. Defend the defenseless and show them they're not alone. Evil happens when people let it happen. And our best defense against it is never to forget where evil leads. That's why International Holocaust Memorial Day was established and why today, 75 years after the liberation of Auschwitz, we remember what once was and pray for the strength to ensure that never may such things happen again. Today is all about you, the survivors, and we are so grateful to all of you that have come. We are also extremely honored to have Rena Quint, one of the survivors who has joined us, to pass on her message of inspiration and hope to us all. Rena grew up in Piotrkov, Poland. At the age of seven, she was deported to a concentration camp with her father. By this time, though, her mother and her two brothers had already been, mur had already been murdered in Treblinka. Her father, realizing that he was not going to be able to hold on to his little girl, disguised Rena as a boy. 
But when he too was murdered, she was adopted by various mothers until her liberation, which happened by the British at Bergen-Belsen. At the end of the war, she moved to Sweden and then to the US. And in 1984, Rina and her husband, Alava Shalom, emigrated to Israel with their four children. Rina never gives up a chance to educate. Jayut's indebted to Rina and to so many of you here that for all the times that you've addressed all of our groups, we want to thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Rina Quint. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Rena Quint, and I was asked three important questions. They're not easy to answer, and each one of us has a different answer. The first one is what I learned from my six mothers. I had six mothers between the ages of three and a half and nine and a half. I don't remember any of them. I certainly don't remember my, my biological mother who was taken away and sent to Treblinka when I managed to run away. But I am sure that what I learned from her was trust and love. Because all my life, every time I had to get a new mother, I had to love her and trust her. And when that mother disappeared, I had another mother whom I had to love and trust and so on and so forth. And finally, the last mother, my sixth mother, I certainly loved and trusted her and she certainly loved and trusted me. I know that I have to do something immediately. If something has to be done, you just do it. And all my life, I have had things to do. One of the things when I was six years old, when my mother, brothers and I were taken into the synagogue in Pietrikov, I ran away. It was not a normal thing to do for a six-year-old to run away from her mother. It was not a normal thing for my mother to, to let me run away, but I ran away because you had to do it. I know that you have to help others. I know that we all have to help others because it's the right thing to do. And also because you help others, you can hope and, and pray that others will help you. I think we all have to adjust to the situation. We have to improvise. We have to be flexible. We never know what's happening. And somehow or other, you have to go along with that. One of the things that I probably got from my biological mother was my name. My name was Fredja or Fredel. Fredel in English means joy. And joy in Hebrew means Rina. And my grandchildren and my friends always felt that I have always shown that I was happy, that I was joyful. And I'm sure that each one of my mothers gave me that feeling that I was special. Whether it was true or not, I got that feeling from them. In these challenging times, what could I suggest to other people to do? They're very difficult times. But I think one of the things that we have to learn is never, ever give up. There's always hope. We have to be optimistic. We have to be good to our family and to our friends. It's the right thing to do. I feel very strongly that I believe in God and pray to God. We have to laugh as much as we can, even if there aren't things that are funny to laugh about. And I think we have to see the good in life. There are so many things that are good don't look at the bad, look at the good. I think we have to love life to the fullest, as much as we possibly can. We have to have fun, enjoy life, do as many enjoyable things as we can. I think we have to be honest and trustworthy. I think we all have to look for peace. No more war. War doesn't help anybody. War hurts everybody. We have to be peace. We have to love as much as we can. We have to support each other. We have to support the state of Israel. If only we had a state of Israel in the 1930s and 40s, we didn't have a state. It wasn't born until 1945. But now we do have a state and we are so lucky and we have to support our state, whether our leaders do the right thing or not, we have to support Israel. And I hope you all get over this terrible 
pandemic that we have. And I hope we start life anew. I got my second um, uh, vaccination yesterday and I feel in two weeks, maybe I can see my children, my grandchildren, great grandchildren and friends again. And I hope to meet many of you again. Holocaust survivors are the strongest way to tell the Holocaust story. It's another level of understanding the Holocaust and it makes it really real. For the first time I felt something, experiencing things as firsthand as you possibly can. We had a rare experience to go to the concentration camp with a Holocaust survivor. The most inspiring trip I've ever had in my life. Hearing stories firsthand from Holocaust survivor in these places, I will carry that with me for the rest of my life. It's our job to speak for what they have witnessed, not only for the Jewish people, but for humanity. When I had the opportunity to meet Leslie, a survivor of Birkenau, one of the most impactful connections that I made, not just as a Jew, but as a person. And for me, I broke down. They're the one they're going to take over. And it's important for me to pass my message to them. We need people to stand up and don't be ashamed of being Jewish. The youngsters are the future of our, our Jewish people. Yeah, it really got to me. They fought through everything in order to survive and carry on. If they had the strength to do something, then I know that I can also. The message I got from him was never give up, like no matter how hard it gets. It's a transformative experience. It changes you as a person. You see what they aim to do. All they wanted was the world without as much hate in it. We are able to walk past this as a free Jewish people. That's something truly, truly remarkable. I do have a Holocaust survivor as a role model. You can see the sort of endurance he had and to translate that into success and radiate such positivity and perseverance, I can translate that into my life. I want to be like him, be proud of who I am. We be the people, we be the next generation to tell our history. Truly being a voice as a Jew, as long as students and young people are willing to face our history, we are able to tell the story to our children and our children's children. We are delighted to welcome David Leitner, better known to the world as Dugo. Dugo now lives in Nir Galim in Israel and has been spreading his message of hope worldwide, teaching in schools, accompanying journeys to Poland, and reaching tens of thousands on social media with his Operation Dugo, remembering the death marches from Birkenau, his dreams of the food of the land of Israel, and his battle for survival. We invite him to share with us some of the things he learned from his parents, as well as what he would like to pass on to the generations of the future. Dugo will then recite the memorial prayer, El Male Rachamim, for all those who perished during the Shoah. In particular, we are remembering more than 1,500 names submitted by you, the survivors present today, of your family members who were murdered. Passing on the torch is about looking to those who are receiving the torch from you, the survivors. Upon registration, we asked you for details of your children, grandchildren, and in some cases, great-grandchildren. We are proud that the names of more than 2,000 descendants were submitted, and it is together with them and with the thousand watching around the world that we will pray for the memory of those who perished. Dugo. Morana Rabotai, Achai Vachyotai, Kahal Nechbat. Shmi, David Leitner, Kulam Korim Li Dugo. Ani Minira Chazo, Shebungaria. לכל איש יש שם שנתנו לו הוריו ושנתנו לו מחנות ההשמדה. לכן, לצערי הרב, יש לי עוד שם שהוריי לא בחרו בשבילי. שם שנכפה עליי כשהייתי בן ארבע עשרה. ומאז הולך איתי לכל מקום. השם הזה כתוב לי על היד. אני B14671. כשעליתי לארץ ישראל, כל מה שהיה לי זה המספר על היד. לא רכוש, 
לא הורים ולא משפחה. יצאתי למצעד המוות בבירקנו למאט אוזן בתאריך 18 לינואר 1945 בקור אימים בלי אוכל, בלי בגדים. אני זוכר את זה כאילו זה היה היום. שנים רציתי לשכוח. מה עשיתי כדי לפתוח דף חדש? התגייסתי לצבא, התאהבתי, התחתנתי, הקמתי משפחה, סיפרתי בדיחות בעצמי וצחקתי מבדיחות של אחרים. בלי הומור לא הייתי מצליח להמשיך לשרוד. כמו שכתבתי בספר שלי, הסיפור של דוגו. מה, לא מספיק שאני אטום, אז שאני אהיה גם עצוב? בטח, בטח לא, לא אני. אלוהים אדירים, כל כך ילד הייתי כשכל זה קרה לי, ואף פעם לא איבדתי את האמונה שאני חייב לשרוד כדי לחיות ולספר לדורות הבאים. אני פונה אל בני הנוער בכל העולם, קחו משהו מיום הזיכרון הזה. אל תיתנו יד למכחישי השואה. תראו סבלנות לאנשים מבוגרים. תראו שיש לכם כוח להאזין ולשמוע. קחו הומור והרבה אמונה ותקווה. זאת עצה ממני דוגו בי אחד על ארבע שש שבע אחד. עם ישראל חי. אל מלא רחמים שולחים במרומים המצא מנוחה נכונה על כנפי השכינה במעלות קדושים וטהורים כזוהר הרקיעה מזהירים את כל הנשמות של ששת מיליוני היהודים חללי השואה באירופה שנהרגו, שנשחטו, שנשרפו ושנספו על קידוש השם בידי המרצחים הנאצים ועוזריהם משאר העמים. לכם בעל הרחמים יסתירם בסתר כנפיו לעולמים ויצרור בצרור החיים את נשמותיהם אדוני הוא נחלתם בגן עדן תהא מנוחתם ויעמדו לגורלם לקץ הימים ונאמר אמן In the Montreal Holocaust Museum sits a piece of defiance, resistance, and at the same time, normality. Fania Fabia turned 20 whilst prisoner in Auschwitz. Her fellow inmates made her a birthday card in the shape of a heart. Its cover is made of a purple fa fabric with an F embroidered in orange thread. And the sheets were glued together using a mix of bread and water. On these sheets, they wrote their blessings and their greetings for this day in Auschwitz. What an act. An act that really could have spelt death for those 18 prisoners who had painstakingly put this card that you see on the screen now together. Fania managed to carry the card through the death march all the way to freedom. The card symbolized for her the inextinguishable flame of hope. The hope, the Hatikva. which has carried our dreams from the gas chambers of Auschwitz to the rolling hills of the Carmel. Philip Muller, the Jewish Sonderkommand in Birkenau, tells us of the historic Hatikva in March of 1944. The Czech family camp arrived to the crematoria, and even though they fought and they resisted, they were finally shoved into the gas chambers. Suddenly, a voice began to sing in Hebrew. The Hebrew song of Hatikva. And all the time, the Germans never began, never gave up on their brutal beatings. When the Jews sang the Hatikva, they were glancing into the future, 
but it was a future that they would not see. Tolstoy once said about us, the Jewish people, he said, the Jew is the emblem of eternity. He who neither slaughter nor torture nor thousands of years could destroy. He who neither fire nor sword nor inquisition was able to wipe off the face of the earth. Such a nation cannot be destroyed. The Jew is everlasting as eternity itself. Hatikva has inspired us, the Jewish people, in the dreams to rebirth and the dignity and the beauty beautifully expresses the fulfillment of Jewish hopes, which we've never lost. Let us end off together with Israel's national anthem, the Hatikva. The day I reached Belzen concentration camp, the fifth day of liberation, was a Friday, the day before the Jewish Sabbath. Reverend L.H. Hartman held an eve of the Sabbath service in the open air in the midst of the camp with joy at their liberation and with sorrow at the memory of their parents and brothers and sisters. These people knew they were being recorded. They wanted the world to hear their voice. Listen. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you to 80 partner organizations from across the world. Thank you to uh, Vievma Virtual Event Management, to Ben and Julian, Johnny Calmus on the film production, and above all, to 150 survivors joining us from across the world. To each one of you, Yehudim, Toda, thank you. Lachaim, Bis 120, ad mea ve 120 in good health, in happiness. Keep teaching us, keep shining and lighting up a dark sky. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>